It's time for another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 461. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday, the 7th of December, and it's the feast of the most wonderful Ambrose in Milan, 397. That's not the episode, that's the date. Okay, as you can tell, whether you're on podcast or whether you're watching us on YouTube, there's three faces on the screen. I have upgraded the software. We can now include as many people as we want to, up to seven, uh, to, for your pre uh, previewing paralysis. Uh, it would be fun, too, because we could do like little Brady Bunch stuff. Uh, but that, that's for later. Uh, first, gentlemen, how are you doing, George? Just fine, Kevin. Just fine. Mm -hmm. It is very, very cold and tiring here in Florida. We're all we're our our local reptile population has uh, slowed down with the uh, fall of the temperature into the fifties, oh. and the uh, old people and myself follow in that we're we're not as spry and limber when it gets this cold. No, I, in fact, I saw pictures of the uh, the football game last night that was in Tennessee, and it was a nice forty seven degrees, but. All those Tennessee people were wearing parkas. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 not yet. Kevin, how are you doing across the pond? Well, the weather is, is cruel, Kevin. It's cold and it's damp and it's rainy. And the government are trying to scare us into madness every single day. <laughs> so psychologically, it's a bit stressful. But spiritually, um, my goodness, we're blessed. It's interesting because I have Gavin on all the time, and there's times that Gavin will te tease me about being a colonist, and there's times that he has a great appreciation for the freedom we have here in America. Uh, <laughs> let's move on a little bit to the news. I took some notes. I forget what they are. Here's the first note. If you like this episode, or if you don't like this episode, click the little like button. You'll see it there on Facebook, or you'll see it on YouTube. Um, please share this episode. Uh, we've got, had a lot of growth in the last couple months, and I think most of this because some of you are finally just swallowing the, the bullet and say, okay, I'm going to share. Hopefully people don't know that I watch, but I'm going to share it, and we appreciate that. Um, we've uh, got Kevin, a I also think that we have a large legal audience who are basically waiting <laughs> for us to trip over an issue. So a number of lawyers are on retainer to watch our episodes. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Anglican Unscripted. Good point, George. Uh, we also need... Uh, How can they not be our views? Could we are Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> well, Just trying to keep, I'm trying to keep I myself out of court. <laughs> So uh, commenting, we've getting a lot more comments and we'll start reading those on the air as we get there. But um, if you wanna comment, the best place to do that is actually on the YouTube channel. Go there, click on your episode and comment. Lots of people have been doing that uh, per episode. And we have a podcast. If you want to find out how to subscribe to a podcast, go to the YouTube channel. The link is in the show notes. All right, let's move on to some real news. Um, did you guys see that Tinker interview? Melvin Tinker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what I, I, think? I, where I thought went very, very well. Melvin has a very now. I'll, I'll do the fluffy stuff. I'll talk do about fluffy. how the presentation and Kevin can, and uh, Gavin can do the content. I thought Gavin, uh, Kevin. Melvin. I thought in Melvin. <laughs> excuse me. I thought he presented himself very well. A very difficult issue, but it could have been a very emotional issue because he immensely essentially was told that he's not welcome in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. I thought he came off wonderfully well. It was a good show. It's one of those interesting things because I don't often you know, invite other people in to our little sanctum here uh, to talk about issues, but his was a, an issue that we've seen so many times where an Orthodox person, uh, a conservative person, uh, tries to come up against the, the gumshoe we call the Church of England, and boom, they're ostracized by his own bishop. Uh, and you know his uh, source of income is cut in half, and he's not allowed to speak on campuses. And his gospel is all of a sudden a different gospel, and it, it, it's kind of this mafia approach. So I wanted to go in and and have a talk with him. Gavin, what kind of response can he expect in England from this? Kevin, I think that um, looking back in history, people might see uh, Melvin's contribution to what we did uh, either on the show itself if we become historically famous in terms of what we produce the media but certainly in terms of his his interaction with national issues here 
as a really critical moment because it was the moment when conviction had it became its own currency. I think we're probably going to talk about the relationship between conviction and uh, and culture later on in the show. But but essentially, um, there's been there's a good deal of of, of banning of people um, in Christian circles. A actually, the the Christian unions, bless them, have been banning people forever in the universities, but for some quite good reasons. They they uh, wanted progressive liberal people not to have much access to young Christians growing in the faith and what, what there was always an irritation for for people who didn't share their particular viewpoint but it was understandable but um, this is one of the first times when liberals have been caught out doing the same thing and at least when the Christian unions and the evangelicals did it they were perfectly clear they said well we need you to subscribe to the this particular interpretation and you, you can't so um, we're not inviting you the trouble with the liberals is they pretend to be inclusive. They pretend anything goes. They pretend to be welcoming, but they don't mean a word of it. Uh, they have their enemies, and Melvin stood for something within Anglican Christianity at the moment that they're really cross about. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's not paying them their money, and they're very frightened of that. So the combination of his 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 integrity and the fact that he's holding them to account financially has really frightened them. And although you have just heard it as a him being banned from a carol service for students in a minor cathedral by a, by a, a less than a first rate dean, symbolically, I think it's much more important than that. And I uh, think tell us. Yeah, I, I, th I think that uh, I want to piggyback on but say that the media response, um, this is not the first bad act that has occurred of uh, banning or discrimination uh, on purely ideological grounds against traditional Christians within the Church of England. But here, the story, the story history was that Jules Gomez wrote a story about this that was published on his website at Anglican Inc. It got picked up on the uh, uh, social media, and then Rod Little of The Spectator mm. wrote an article about this condemning wholeheartedly the Dean of Derby. Derby. Um, that last hook, if you will, moving it into the spectator, moving it into greater than the usual circles of Anglican chat, uh, I think is very, very significant. Because of what I saw, what I read in Rob Little's article was that this is symbolic of a whole assault uh, by the establishment against intellectual and moral liberties and freedom. And the really important part is that we've moved from sex to free speech. Sex was always an embarrassing thing to have to argue about. Um, but free speech, everybody agrees. That's absolutely critical. And so for someone like Rod Little, and then also the correspondent of the Sunday Times, which is a Nicholas big, Heller, Nicholas Heller, to say, uh, um, this is a free speech issue. And the so-called liberals who are so-called in favor of free speech are hammering their opponents and banning them, gagging them, which is hypocrisy. Well, this becomes uh, a really significant way of understanding what's going on. One of the things I found interesting... And, and may, I, may I also say that what, though the Sunday Times and the Spectator uh, ran and presented this issue in favor of Melvin Tinker, we did not see any counterpunching in The Guardian or any of the liberal magazines saying that, well, the dean has the right to protect these young students from the, the malicious, malign influence of Melvin Tinker. In other words, there's been no punchback in the popular press, there's been punchback uh, within the church world, but they've lo but essentially they've lost this one, and they're losing. They have well, it has such bigger implications. He indicated that those people, they're company people, they're no longer church people. They they operate in a, ter a, a different sphere of influence and desire for what's happening on the ground here in England, and I'm like, you know, that really applies all the way up maybe to Lambeth in other places and we're starting now to get uh, news in from different provinces of we're going to go to Lambeth, we're not going to go to Lambeth, different primates have indicated what they're doing in different bishops and I thought this is a great transition for us to talk about you know more of this uh, there's company people who wants to hang out with company people and who thinks they can still influence company people uh, latest press release uh, we're going to put out Rwanda they are not going to go so we add them to Uganda and Nigeria. Um, have we heard anybody else that's not going to Lambeth 2020? 
Well, what we do know uh, is that Laurent Mabanda, the primate, the Archbishop of Rwanda, has informed the GAFCON Primates Council that he and his bishops have agreed they're not going to Lambeth unless certain preconditions are met. And those are that the Anglican Church in North America, the Anglican Church of Brazil, are invited on equal footing with the Episcopal Church. So they have basically signed on to the same level of uh, concern that Nigeria and Uganda. Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda are the three largest provinces in terms of Sunday attendance. And those three will, for all intents and purposes, not be going to Lambeth. Now, who else may be going, may not be going? Uh, it's up in the air in some places. Uh, I know the Indian Ocean has a new uh, a, a primate who is of age Chinese descent, and he is quite strong on this issue, uh, but his province hasn't decided. South Sudan is uh, quite strong in this issue, but they are in such desperate straits. Uh, they may need to go just to keep their flag flying so people still remember we're still alive. <laughs> Kenya will be gone. Um, well, it, it's interesting because the second part of the question is, you know, what good is Lambeth anymore? You know, when it was uh, brought back together in the, the early uh, uh, 18th, 20th century, uh, 19th century, there was a desire to keep us together, to encourage, to be a body of Christ, to, to answer any doctrinal concerns. Um, that no longer applies. Kevin, I, well, I, I'm, I'm very disappointed uh, at GAFCON in Jerusalem mm -hmm. because I felt very strongly that one of the things that had to be done was the formation of an alternative Anglican communion, mm -hmm. a formation of, a diff of an orthodox Anglican jurisdiction. We, we, had, we had written letters and warned them in 2008. We did it again in 2013. There had to be something more than that. And one of the reasons there had to be something more is, is you, we need to offer people something more than just not going to Lambeth. Uh, the, we, there should be a way of um, nailing our colors of conviction to a mast that is creative and productive and takes us forward rather than simply walking out of the room. And I think it's a really, GAFCON I think has, has, has well I don't use the word failed, I think it's made a mistake in terms of not being able to draw together a jurisdiction. Even now, I think what GAFCON should do in the face of Lambeth 2020 is say, well, for those who are not going, uh, let us organize a parallel event or sure. you know, something where we say, we will do it together rather than leave you in your, you know, just not going somewhere. It, it, people are paying a very high price not going to Lambeth. I've no doubt at all that if, that if I was a, a, a bishop in a diocese in the Anglican Communion and I was invited once every 10 years to Lambeth Palace, I would want to go and I'd want to be in the pictures and I'd hang the pictures up in the washroom downstairs and I'd say to people, look, I was important once. <laughs> and, and whilst that might not have been true, I think people are sacrificing something really important. Well, and it is, it is the moment to, to, to start an orthodox, to recalibrate orthodox Anglicanism across the world. Before I move on to George, I want to mention, I did an interview once with Gerald Bray, and he said, you guys have a different understanding of the Church of England because you're outside the Church of England than we do. He says, many people within England just think of it like a, a public library. It's a place where you go for your baptisms, and it's just part of the, the culture. It's there if you need it, but if you don't need it, no big deal. We have a romance kind of with the Church of England. The, the, the Sea of Canterbury, the, the Roland Williams, the Justin Welbys of the world uh, have an image in us, a true image or not, that we want to maintain a relationship with. And I, I can see a lot of people that go to GAFCON uh, still want that to romanticize that part of Anglicanism. And so when uh, we find some go to Lambeth and some don't go to Lambeth and that GAFCON didn't take the final step and say we're going to... Uh, slice it here and you can join GAFCON or you can join the Anglican Communion. Um, I see that in the romance of the Sea of Canterbury, the romance of uh, how the Church of England formed and, and uh, the history it has with the Episcopal Church and whatnot. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to be personal for a moment. I, sure. I, went to, I went to the oldest school in the world. It was started in 597 by the monks who came to Canterbury. And so I, I grew up, my school's built around Canterbury Cathedral. For five years, I, I, I spent my whole adolescence there. 
I didn't find Jesus there. When I found Jesus after I left, I looked back and thought, how is it possible that this, this center of world Christianity could have managed to hide Jesus from me? Now, the rest of my story doesn't matter very much, but I think in the end, there do come moments, even though I'm a traditionalist and I've become an old fogey, when you have to decide on the presence of God and a relationship with Jesus before history, culture, nostalgia, and tribe. And, and the, the, you know, there are moments when that happens. Melvin Tinker was important because he said, that moment's come for me, I'm gonna pay the price and here it is. Other people have been doing and saying the same thing. We need to help those who don't go to Lambeth 2020 to, to pay that price and, and offer them something, something better, which, which is of course a, a new configuration of the body of Christ, of people who are staying close to Jesus and what he taught rather than betraying him and going with his enemy which is essentially the big narrative of what we're talking about. George, I, well, I, I want to follow up with what he, he said to you. I thought Gavin, what, Gavin, I'm sorry, I thought GAFCON was trying to provide itself as an alternative to the Church of England and to Lambeth. Uh, it's not possible the way okay. GAFCON's currently con constituted. Um, why do the Central Africa is one of the most conservative provinces and they do not have women clergy. They will not have women clergy. They are quite strong on the issue of gay marriage and all of that. Yet the Central African Church, uh, under the last uh, archbishop, has been buddy-buddy with uh, Lambeth Palace. Why does West Africa? Why, why does Munir Anis of Egypt, who in the meetings is very strong, but will be at Lambeth 2020? Why does Burundi go along? Well, the answer is not theological, but for instance, Munir needs, as we discussed last week, he needs the Anglican connection to be able to preserve his church from the predations of the Presbyterians, of all things. Monsters. In Central Africa, they are funded by the SPG. Mm -hmm. They have to go along to get along. The SPG is a very liberal mission society. It is under, it is under the firm hand of the establishment of the Church of England. And if their bishops, uh, can do what they like in their own diocese, but they have to, when they appear on the world stage, conform. It's the same with West Africa. And it's the same with South Sudan. South Sudan, the, the nation is in such dire straits that they need any help that they can. And there's an, an idea that the Church of England is still the Church of England, a branch of the government. And so people make this assumption that, well, maybe Justin Welby can intercede with me on behalf of the British Foreign Office. Okay. Well, the only time Justin Welby intercedes is on gay rights issue and threatens African nations unless they adopt uh, a Western European model on uh, gay life and marriage. George, this is where I could get really very angry indeed. I, 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 in the last few years, we've seen Syrian refugees making their way towards Europe. And there have been arguments about how complex foreign policies are and, and how bad Assad was or wasn't and, and you know what the, what the political configurations between Saudi Arabia and Putin and England were. But one of the things that was absolutely clear was when it came to giving Syrians asylum in this country, we've given a very large number of Syrians asylum. But of all those we've given, the, the scores of thousands We've only given uh, 11 Syrian Christians asylum. Now, at this point, if the Archbishop of Canterbury pretended to have any influence at all uh, with the government, one of the things he should say is, why are you exercising a pro-Islamic refugee policy and a specifically anti-Christian refugee policy when it comes to giving Christian refugees asylum here? And that would have been worth doing, but we've heard nothing at all. Instead, he stood up and, and gained plaudits for wringing his hands about the genocide of Christians in the Middle East. That's true. That's important. But it's useless without any action. If he had the power to act, he should have used it, and he hasn't. What does that say about the integrity of the Church of England in the, when it really matters? Well, uh, Gavin, on, we have on. to be fair. No, no, Gavin, we have to be fair. They did a point a half Iranian woman as Bishop of Loughborough <laughs> to take care of all these Middle East Christians who eventually wind up in England. Is that not true? I can they do didn't better. they give a job to somebody? <laughs> I can do better than that. Do they not house refugees on the grounds of uh, Lambeth? They did, Kevin. They did. What, what happened to them? 
I don't know, George. Uh, they, uh, well, the uh, Grace and Favor Apartments uh, new tenants have come in. They've been chewed away. Oh. Uh, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> The uh, because these people are out of sight, out of mind, and out sure. of the news cycle, it's time to move on to do to the next thing. I want to jump on top of what Gavin said and give another example of the mendacity of the London bureaucracy, the Anglican Communion. Uh, Muhammad Buhari, uh, the president of Nigeria, he's a Muslim, has been under sharp attack from the Church of Nigeria, specifically some. Uh, Emmanuel Chuck Wuma, one of uh, the Archbishop uh, of uh, what is what used to be called Biafra, has sharply denounced uh, the government for being pro-Muslim, for favoring Muslims in government jobs, for allowing Muslim Fulani tribesmen to massacre Christian farmers. And Muhammad Buhari took to the pages of the Church Times last week to, add, to do a Rodney King which for non-American audiences is, why can't we all get along? Sure. And here's the joke of it. I don't think the Church Times has a very wide circulation in Nigeria. And why was this done? So who was the well, name? Because, what, what, who was the audience? The audience was the British establishment. Because three weeks earlier, Ben Kwashi, the new uh, secretary of Lambeth, of GAFCON, had come to the UK, had warned of, the, of what may be a uh, impending genocide of a re religion war uh, between Christians and Muslims. And what the Lambeth did in conjunction with the ACC is cut the legs out from underneath the Church of Nigeria and GAFCON. Here we've got, uh, within the British establishment. I mean, running an article by a Nigerian president is a coup for the Church Times, but it was a tool in the arsenal to destroy the influence of GAFCON and the Church of Nigeria in the its own country and within the wider African church world. Uh, George, on behalf of our audience, I need to speak up here. You're pulling a kerchief. You're pounding when you speak. <laughs> I'll sit on my hand. <laughs> you just for quiet out loud. I can't believe I'm they did my that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Kevin's doing it right. Doesn't hurt the microphone so much. <laughs> So, uh, and to, to the audience, this is the first time we've done this three thing. We, we're getting used to it. We don't know if we're going to continue it or it's just going to be something we do special. Uh, we have to work off our dynamics of uh, breaking in and interrupting and stuff like that. Um, let us get used to it. If this doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I thought it'd be interesting because these are big international stories and we have Lambeth coming up. And there are also domestic stories. We, we've had some correspondence from people in the Church of England saying, can you believe that the Rod Thomas, Bishop Rod Thomas, who's the safe, good, loving, true evangelical conservative bishop, has posted on his website his announcement that he went and participated in the enthronement of Vivian Fall as Bishop of Bristol. And now, did he, the question is, well, he's, was he being polite? I mean, it's a done deal. She's a bishop. He might as well go and have a nice lunch and meet his friends. Was he being uh, collegial? Was he being congenial? Was he just trying to mend fences? Or was he essentially saying that the that it's more important to go along than and, and get along? I, I find this a very difficult issue because I, I, you know, we don't know the facts. I guess Rod Thomas may want to come back and explain. But at the heart of it, we're, we're back with Melvin Tinker. We're back with the question that faces <clears throat> uh, many people in the Church of England, at uh, what point do you prefer your conscience to the club? And the, the club is very powerful. Um, I, I know that Rod has uh, experiences his, his um, role within the House of Bishops. It must, be, it must be very difficult for him being so isolated theologically. But if you hold the views that Orthodox Christians hold about the, the, the non-bishopness of women bishops um, and if you also then add to the fact that Vivian Fall amongst other outspoken feminists is has been very verbose about gay marriage uh, and, and and as so many of them are calling into question God's own preferred pronoun why would you associate in public on such important occasions with the very people who you've taken a stand against for the sake of the gospel without some kind of disclaimer well you know bless him on 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 his um 
web page, he had a nice, li nice little card, one of those precious cards that the Church of England <laughs> sent round to important for important events to people, going to Vivian's consecration, uh, her, her installment, enthronement rather. I, I don't understand why he did that. I hope he'll explain. But I think it muddies the waters and it, it makes, for example, Melvin stand more, more significant uh, and, and more potent. One of the bigger difficulties we have now that we have three people is assigning roles. Now, at the beginning, I think we pulled off the introduction pretty well. You agree, guys? <laughs> yeah, we did okay? All right. So we're going to pull off the closing. And in the past, I would say, oh, thank you for watching Anglican Unscripted. And then somebody, one of you, would uh, uh, certainly say, you've been watching episode blah, blah, blah of Anglican Unscripted. Blah, 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 461. Okay. So, so I'm going to let everybody know this is 461. And you guys can figure out what you want to do as we close out. Thank you for watching Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and it's Pearl Harbor Day. And it, it what was it, St. Uh, Ambrose. Ambrose. Ambrose, <laughs> Ambrose Day. 397. <laughs> <laughs> and he converted St. Augustine. Uh, and and um, he ought to be an inspiration to us in terms of putting right. conscience. I, I want to pull more before we hit the, the, I got in a slight bit of trouble. The Church Society put out a, uh, little tweet saying this month let us pray for the cathedrals of the church of england and be their <laughs> evangelical witness sure and i asked a question are they being ironic uh, in this uh, question and it really offended some people i i don't understand the british sense of humor i mean it, to throw a foreigner looking at it this was very very funny yeah. uh but i guess they they are serious it it's, just may, it may have taken them a while george to understand the deep irony you've pointed them to it they'll come to it in the end indeed i forgot to do this little graphic thing i put together yeah i got this whole new system it's going to take a lot a little while to learn uh up front but we, we thank you for your patience and your donations uh i don't know if i told you guys we do friday leftovers here so after everybody has done all their stuff They've done Cyber Monday. They've done their Black Friday shopping. They've done all the hedonist things they could do. We get the leftovers. They're supposed to take what's left in their accounts and give it to us. And basically, we got $40 last week. So everybody really did spend all of their money. <laughs> I do want to thank. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. I'm still Gavin Ashenden. Thank you for listening. <laughs>